Hey, welcome. You know, this service was attended exactly, exactly for you. So you're not here by any accident. You didn't stumble upon this. We're worried about and, and stressing about each and every one of us just leading ourselves to the cross each and every day. So this service is all about you getting yourself closer to the Lord. There's amazing miracles about to happen. We are so glad you're here. Let's get right to service.
Hey, welcome back. Great service so far. We want to just bring to your attention a couple things that are going on. First of all, we got a lot of Bible studies going on, and that's a great opportunity for you just to get into a small group setting, to be a part of an intimate relationship with others in the church, to be able to just have people pray for you, to be able to read the Word of God together, and to do great things. So I pray right now that you get connected in one of our small Bible studies and really become part of a family in that. I also want to bring forth, we have a vacation Bible school going on, and it's in July. And you can check this out on our website. Get your kids here. Um, get your kids just inserted into what God is doing. There's going to be hundreds of kids here. Make this part of your life. Make this part of your kids' life. You can look that up. Jennifer, where can they find all this information? We have so many great things going on for the whole family, so make sure you check out the website, thehillministries.church, and click on the events tab. Now we're going to get back to service. Amen.
wants to do something in your life. As I've told you time and time again, you have not arrived. I don't care how old you are, Buzz. You have not arrived. It's his birthday today, so make sure you wish him happy birthday. Don't ask him how old, just as his birthday today, okay? 18, yeah. But here's the thing. God always wants to do something in your life. He's constantly wanting to do something in your life. And the key is, are you willing to let him do something? Do you want him to do something? Are you content with where you're at? Have you gotten lazy in your, in your walk with the Lord to where you're like, oh, I've got enough knowledge. I've got enough information. I'm just good right now. Are you ready to grow and go forward? Christ has came and he's changed everything. He truly has. We just celebrated a couple of weeks the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as we did that, I told you every Sunday we gather together in celebration once again of the resurrection. And today we gather once again to reflect on the changes that he's made through his resurrection and in our lives. He has rose to change us, to give us eternal life, to give us salvation like, like no lamb could give us, to give us, to give us life eternal like, like no covenant uh, before had given us. This is a new covenant in Christ Jesus that we have eternal life through Jesus Christ who was victorious over death, sin, and the grave. And we are here today to celebrate it. So if you just want to mellow Sunday, after, Sunday day and Sunday afternoon, then you just sit back and enjoy. But some of us are going to get a little excited during this time because we're excited to be in the presence of the Lord and with a family that truly wants to celebrate Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Have you come to realize, though, that you're being changed every day? Have you really come to realize that? I mean, we're, we're all being changed every day. Some of us more rapidly than others. And some of us, it's a spiritual thing. And some of us, it's a physical and spiritual thing. I got stories from this week that I may share later. I don't know if I'll get to them or not. But, but uh, you know, I'm changing. I'm changing not only, not only spiritually, but I'm changing physically too getting better. That's what my wife says, right? Amen. But we're being changed. And if we abide in Jesus, you're being built up in him. You're being built up to, to do his work and to be his workman. Today, we're going to read scripture as we're standing. I know we don't always do it this way, but I have an anchor scripture I'm going to get to through my message, but I want us to get it into us really early in the service today. If you have your Bibles, you want to grab them and uh, we'll, the lights will come up slowly for you to be able to read them and it will be on the board. We're going to be in the book of 1 Corinthians. We'll also have some time in, one of, in Timothy and, and uh, oh, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. We, we may go all over the place. We'll just have to see how, how, we, how it goes today. But 1 Corinthians chapter 3. been preparing a study in the book of 1 Corinthians, and, and uh, so my mind and my heart is drawn to it a lot recently. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9 through 17. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's fields, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation 
and someone else is building upon it. Let everyone take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's works will become manifest. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you know, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Let's pray. Lord, help us today to open, to be open, to be yielded and to be responsive to your word and to the Holy Spirit as we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. You may be seated. God bless you. Thank you for being here today in person and those that are joining us online. We truly appreciate it. This is the Sunday before Mother's Day. Next Sunday's Mother's Day. I'm just giving you a warning right now. Mother's Day next Sunday. If, if you mess up, it's not my fault now. Okay? You've been warned. Do what needs to take place for Mother's Day, and that is next Sunday. Next Sunday also, I'd love for you to bring your mother to be a part of this service here. Now, I, I invite you to this service, and we don't have a, uh, we, we're not bringing in a special guest speaker or anything, but this is uh, the time, I don't do it every year, but I do it a lot of times during this time of year. This is the time I share my testimony. And I'm going to share it this year on Mother's Day. My mother will be here, and she, went, she, she was a little bit of a part of my testimony. So it's going to be special, I believe, for her also. So please come back next week for my testimony. Some of you have heard it. Some of you have heard bits and pieces of it. Some of you know some of the things I went through that, to bring me to where I am today. But God gave me a testimony, just like he's given each and every one of you a testimony. Some of you don't realize it, and I hope next week in the service you're going to recognize that you have a testimony to give to others. Amen? Amen. Paul is writing a letter to the Corinthian church. It's a powerful letter of correction and instruction. How many here need correction and instruction at times? Oh, only some of you, but I think all of you probably do. If you've ever been a parent, if you've ever been, uh, uh, if you've ever been a teacher, if you've ever been uh, given the task of training someone uh, to do something, or maybe you're a supervisor today. If you, if you work in an environment where you're a supervisor, you understand that what Paul's going through right now and why he's writing this letter. You give instruction, you, you build manuals, you, you set up procedures, and then, and then you have to reinforce them over and over and over again. How many's given somebody instructions on how to do something and they have found a shortcut not knowing that the shortcut is going to destroy something down the road? Oh man, that's, that's, that happens all the time. So what do you do? You come back and you see where they're kind of letting down and you build them back up in that area. And that's what this letter to the church and to us today is all about. He wants to build us up. He wants to train us. I have found that visualization is the most important, especially in raising children and in training people. If you can give somebody, if you can, if you can set somebody down and show them a picture or show them a diagram of how something works and it begins to click in their mind, it makes more sense. And so Paul, throughout his writings, what does he do a lot of times? He builds a picture for us. Have you ever heard the saying, a picture's worth a thousand words? And, and almost all of us have heard that at some point. A picture's worth a thousand words. But I have something to add to that. Not only is a picture worth a thousand words, but a good mentor is worth 10,000 pictures. 
A good mentor is worth 10,000 pictures. So, so if, you, if you think a picture's worth 1,000 words, a good mentor that lives their life according to the standards of God's word is worth 10,000 pictures. See, we, we pick in life, we're gonna always pick people that we look up to or we admire. Uh, it, it's, it's something that, I don't know, we just do. I, I don't know all the uh, psychological reasons for doing it, but I remember as a young boy looking up to men and, and thinking, I want to be like them when I get, when I get older, and, and now I'm older, and I'm like, I didn't make it. <laughs> we, had some, we had some good men. I, I look at my dad, who, who passed away in 2019, and as I, as I still visit his grave, I think, this guy was a great man. He did great things. He accomplished wonderful things. He, he set us up for ministry today, even on this hill. If it wasn't for him and his, and his uh, 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 some would say stubbornness, and we'll just use that right now because that's, that's the word that came to my mind, we would not have held onto this land for all these years to build this great work of God. He knew that God called him to buy this property in 1988, and he said, God's work will be built on this. All the opportunities, all the things that came, all the obstacles that came to us building this property, he, he, just, he just pushed them aside and said, this will be a piece of property that the house of God will be built on. And you know what? Today we're worshiping in that house. He was a great mentor. He showed me 10,000 and thousands of pictures through my life. He was a great example to me. And today we have people that are admiring you as a follower of Jesus Christ. Some of them aren't quite admiring you yet because they want to see how things work out. I've got to tell you, we need to be Christians that things work out for. Things aren't going to be always rosy. As I talked on uh, uh, Thursday night about 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses uh, 18, rejoice always, uh, uh, 16. Rejoice always, uh, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Amen. See, we need Christians that live their life that way. Another letter from Paul. But today we have a lot of Christians that aren't living like Christians. We have a lot of people that we say, oh, look at that good Christian man. But then he has attitudes and, and habits and, and things in his life that are destructive to him and to the work of God. And Paul's writing a letter to the church. People are watching you. Don't take, don't take that in a creepy way. I, one of my daughters just started a new job recently, and, and she, she helps customers. And, and she's, she's had a lot of customers that she thinks, they're creepy. <laughs> my daughters are all beautiful, aren't they? And those, those, you know, some 35-year-old guy wants to stand at her window and talk to her at, at the bank, you know. Okay, then I won't go there. Because she needs to have a picture of her dad, you know, back when he was 45 and really looked good, you know. But uh, with the shotgun, yeah, cleaning the guns, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, people are watching us. They're watching us and, and, and they're, they're, they're going to see whether you're walking and growing in Jesus Christ or, or if you're setting a good example or you're not setting a good example. I've seen some very disturbing pictures, very inconsistent mentors. And most all of this is brought to us by the fact that people are building their lives on some poor foundations. In Matthew chapter 7, we read the story, uh, and I won't take time to read it to you right now, about the wise man and the foolish man. The foolish man, all the kids know it, the foolish man built his house upon the sand. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And when the storms come, the sand gives way and the house collapses. It, but built on the rock, what do you do? You stand. You stand firm. I, I want us to pray for Anover 
Kansas. Boy, that tornado was something else that went through there. F3 tornado. I, I look at some of the devastation. Vicki and I watched probably an hour worth of video from, from amateurs that, that, that did it with drones and, and off the back. Of their, when a tornado comes through Kansas, Kansans go out and videotape it. And that's, that's an old saying. They don't videotape it. They put it on their cell phones. I'm sorry. I'm showing my age once again. Who has videotape in their home? Okay, just a few of you. All right. <clears throat> So they, so they run outside and, and take video of the storm. Where was I going with that boy? That devastation comes through town. And I seen those houses, some of those houses that were built slab on grade, we call it. And just the whole house, all you see is the slab. And I think, yeah, that house was built on a foundation, but it wasn't something that was strong enough to protect the whole house. Concrete housing is the way to go. Let me, I, wait, <laughs> go to that another time. See, we need to pray for them. We need to pray for Ukraine. I've seen, I've seen the devastation there. Some of the, some of the buildings that rockets and missiles have been uh, launched into and, and the concrete structures are still remaining and, and they still have some kind of safety in some of them, but ultimately it's a... It's a it's a place of destruction. Why is it, why is it being destroyed? Because, because men are evil. Men are evil. We, we look at both sides of the situation. There, there's wrong on both sides. There's evil on both sides. But ultimately, men are evil. And we will destroy. Foundations are so important. In Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16, it says, Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am the one who has laid a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. I looked that up in the Hebrew. I wanted to make sure that I truly understood this, this passage of Scripture. And that last part, whoever believes will not be in haste. The Hebrew language goes like this. Whoever believes, uh, uh, whoever believes not will not act hastily. Whoever believes not will act hastily. There's many translations as the NIV puts it, the one who uh, relies on it will never be stricken with panic. The uh, uh, New Living Translation says whoever believes need never be shaken. Uh, the Bereans, their, their, their interpretation is the, the one who believes will never be shaken. NASB says the one who believes in it will not be disturbed. I love the Amplified. It says, he who believes, who trusts in, relies on, and adheres to the stone will not be disturbed or give way in sudden panic. See, if our lives are built on the, on the truth of this world, ultimately we're going to be shaken. Our whole world in the last couple of years has been shaken by a bunch of deceitful lies. To control the whole nation and ultimately the whole world. Now I could get real political here. I'm not, gonna, I'm not trying to get political, but I'm just telling you, God's word is truth. We, we many times we come to an area in our life and we want to go to uh, the wisest person we know here on earth. We want to go to the, to the educated people, the, the uh, psychologist and the psychiatrist, and we want, to, we want to go get help. We want to read a new book, and I'm going to get to that later in my message. We want to read a book from a new author that has the answers to all our problems. Uh, and ultimately, we need to go to the truth, the way, the light. There are more answers in here than, than as, as it used to be said, that you could shake a stick at. <laughs> Somebody look that up and tell me what that means after service, okay? It just comes to me sometimes. It's got the answers to our life. But we want, we want to go to the world's truth. We want to go to the world's foundation. How's the world's foundation worked out for us lately? It's not worked out that well. See, we need to go to God. I, I mentioned this on Tuesday night's uh, men's Bible study, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. And, and from that night to, to, to today, it has stuck with me. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. As some translations, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
See, what we don't realize is the world without God has no real wisdom. They just continue to feed us lies and deceit. But ultimately, once we recognize who God truly is, there can be true wisdom and knowledge. But until you recognize who God is, there cannot be. We live in a world that we have become God. I, I covered this briefly last week, and, and, and I'm going to just barely touch on it again for another sermon way down the road. But ultimately, we are not God. Ever since the 70s and before, we have been trained to think that we are God. We can govern life. We can govern our, our destiny, our future. We can govern everything. And today, we're governing it in such a way that we, have, we are making determination in certain parts of the United States of America that, that we control life even up to 28 dear, days after the birth of a child. What a tragedy that we have eliminated God, the creator of everything, and we've inserted ourselves in that place. What kind of foundation is that? Paul, the mentor, builds a picture of the church. He, he's he's going to tell us what is the foundation. That there are a lot of people trying to build on it. That they, that they better be real careful the sort of materials they're using while they're building on it. Paul's concern, Paul's concern and his warning uh, to the teachers is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 there. It says, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. It's so important that that one, we gather the foundation, we figure out what the foundation is. Jesus Christ is our cornerstone. He is the foundation. When we built this building, there was a footing, a giant footing poured all the way around, dug down, uh, got onto some solid ground, and what? They poured a concrete footing all the way around, and everything that came after it is governed by that footing. If the footing's off, the footing's bad, the footing's wrong, you're going to have problems. He, he tells us, I laid, Paul came, and as he, as he started these churches, he laid a good, strong foundation, and then someone else comes and builds upon it. Earlier in this chapter, they're having a struggle. Well, I listen to Paul, I listen to Apollos. No, it doesn't matter who you listen to, it matters what they're teaching you. Are we being taught the word of God? Or are we just going because we like the personality? That guy yells a little louder than the other guy. And I, sorry, I get carried away and I, I raise my voice. I'm, but, but ultimately, we, we like a style or we like this or we like that. But ultimately, are they teaching you the word of God? Are they teaching you truth? Verse 11 says this, uh, uh, why the teacher must be careful. It says, Verse 11, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Do you see the connection between verse 10? Watch out how you build upon the foundation. And verse 11, Christ is the only foundation. What that means is that the foundation must control the materials of the superstructure that's being built. The foundation... I'm going to say again, the foundation must control the materials used in the superstructure being built. I recently bought a shed for my backyard because I'm an American. <laughs> and I've got too much stuff. And I wanted to get a car, another car in the garage, so I got the lawnmower now and stuff in the, in the shed. But, but that shed, it's... It's not built on a foundation. It's built on some wood, and it's, and it's going to be there uh, the rest of my life probably. But uh, <laughs> kids, if you're looking to inherit that, don't look too, you know, it's not going to be that great. But, but here's the thing. It determined what kind of material they used on the building of that shed. But God's building a church, not only a building, but he's building you up as a church. And that foundation that you're, that you're on 
it needs to, it needs to determine what quality of material you put into it. Watch out what kind of windows you're using because the foundation is in Christ. The windows are what we see with, aren't they? The windows are what we see. Our eyes are the windows. What are you letting your eyes see? As I've told you time and time again, I, I speak from a man's perspective. I've never been a woman. I'll never be a woman. But I can tell you, men, we have a problem with our eyes. We're drawn to see things and look at things that we shouldn't look at. What kind of windows should we have? At times, you need some good blackout shades, guys. I could go on, but I got a lot of stuff here, and I'm already 24 minutes in, so let's, let's keep. The eyes, we got we to gotta consider what kind of windows we're putting in this superstructure that Christ is building right here. What are we going to allow our eyes to see? What are we going to look at? We got to watch out what kind of roof we build on the foundation of Christ. Are we going to use good materials? That roof protects us and, and it keeps us strong because ultimately, if, if we don't build a, 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 a good roof, what happens is the walls get wet or the foundation of the footing gets uh, soaked with water instead of a roof that what sheds the water off and gets it away and so that your, so that your structure remains strong and good. Afterwards, please don't correct me on my building techniques, okay? I just, just want to let you know. We need to watch out what kind of wiring we put in the house. Because the foundation is Jesus Christ. What kind of wiring we put in our house is the kind of thing that, 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 kind, of, that kind of keeps things going. What, what, kind of, what kind of gives us that perk and that shock and that, that electricity to keep moving and, and for things to keep happening? What, what, what are you letting govern you in the structure that's being built in you by Jesus Christ? Are you, letting, are you letting the outside influence of the world motivate you or are you letting God's word motivate you? Are you motivated by the spirit or are you motiv motivated by the movies? Are you motivated by the spirit or are you motivated by the newest trend in our culture? Are you motivated by the word of God or are you motivated by uh, uh, whatever news program that you like to watch the most? They're not really news programs anymore. They're depression programs. It does make sense. The foundation controls the shape and the quality of the building. And it's so important that we recognize the foundation is Jesus Christ and everything I let into this, this structure, this, this building here, but also us as individuals is so, so very important. The foundation and how we build on it, there's only one foundation and that's Christ. In other words, what Paul's doing here is he's, he's creating an image for the church, a building that, that, uh, that, that we need to, grasp hold of. He's, he's exalting Christ as absolute preeminent. Not only is he the bottom of it that's holding it all together, but he's the thing that influences it utterly from the foundation to the roof. Christ has an influence on all. The consequences, though, of shoddy building is this. What we'll see next is the warning to pastors, to teachers, to counselors, to parents, to disciples of all kinds. These are the dangerous consequences of building the church or building ourselves with materials that are not in keeping with the greatness of Christ and his foundation. First of all, you can injure the church. Number one thing, if you, if you use shoddy material to build your church, your own spiritual self and the body of Christ, if you use those inferior materials, what's going to happen is you're going to injure the church. Verses 12 through 13 of 1 Corinthians, it says, Now, if anyone builds on a foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it. And now, that, 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 that saying, the day will disclose it, there will be a judgment of all. 
there, there's more than one judgment. Uh, matter of fact, there's one judgment you don't want to be a part of. Part of there's another judgment you you want to be a part of. Okay. And and when I say judgment, what what immediately comes to mind here in the United States? Matthew seven, judge not lest you be judged. Let me tell you, we are constantly judged, and all the time we don't mind some judgment. When I, I was going down the road the other day at, at 60 miles an hour and, and there was radar right up here on the hill and you know what? I didn't mind being judged. Now, a few days earlier, I'm glad he wasn't there. So, so here's, we're being judged all the time. We don't like to be judged negatively and, 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 and but we're, we're going to be judged one day from all our works. And ultimately, are they good works or the bad works? Goes on to say the days will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If you build into the church or into yourself doctrines or attitudes or actions that do not fit with the foundation of Jesus Christ, then the fire of judgment will end up destroying it in the age. And it begins in the church. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, it says, it tells us that in the house of the God is where judgment begins. It says, for it it is time for the judgment to begin at the house of God. That's where judgment begins. We need to be testing things all the time, whether they are of God, whether they, they uh, know him, love him, or show him. That's our kind of, our story pole for building stuff is know him, love him, show him. If our ministries are not promoting knowing him, loving him, and showing him, then we're failing short of what God has called us to do. <laughs> So the judgment starts in the church. We should labor to build into the church and to ourselves doctrines and attitudes and behaviors that will come forth from the fire and test it as gold, fine gold, silver, and diamonds for the glory of Christ, not for the glory of you. Second thing that will destroy is the building, the builder loses a reward. Verses 14 and 15. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive reward. We need to get excited about that. You, you like to get rewarded. Many of you get rewarded every Friday or every other Friday or once a month and you don't deserve it. You may think you do, but you, you may not deserve it. Others, you, you deserve it fully. I, be, I believe that. But ultimately, all your work's going to be tested. And, and, and those that are building yourselves up in the church of Jesus Christ, it's going to be tested. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to go through the fire, and I want to receive a reward. Not to, not to reward boastfully, but to reward in Christ Jesus for what he is doing and what he has done in me. Goes on to say, verse 3, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only through fire. See, it's possible to be a Christian and be harmful and to have and to be a harmful teacher in the church. Christians can have much doctrine wrong, they can have wrong attitudes, and they can have blind spots in their life. And they can impart things that are made of wood, hay, straw, stubble to other Christians. And ultimately, those will be tested in the last day. Not one of those will escape the chastisement. For none of us is a perfect pastor None of us is a perfect teacher, parent, or counselor. So it's so important that we become vigilant in what? In making sure our convictions, our attitudes, what we give to other people also is biblical. There, there are so many things that I hear going on in the church today that are unbiblical, that, that we've gotten off base and, we, and we've given the way we want things to be or the way we feel things should be. And ultimately, that will destroy us. In, first, in 2 Timothy, it's so important that we be vigilant. In 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, 
Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who is, has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. You guys really like it in the King James Version because the King James Version says this, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The last one is destruction of the church and ourselves. Verse 17, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. One of the ways to attack the foundation directly and break it up. This has been done in a number of ways by dictators, by governments, and by other antichrist radicals throughout history. Beginning in the New Testament church, if, you're, if you've been around our Bible studies on Thursday night, we've shared the antichrist mentality that came into the church very early on. Just, just a matter of years after, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, an antichrist mentality and spirit came into the church of Jesus Christ and had to be, had to be corrected by the apostles and the writings that we have today. But you know the best way to destroy the church, the work of Jesus Christ? It's, it's by slow death. See, there's been biblical warnings. Jesus Christ warned of the destruction of the church and, and people coming in that, that were, their hearts were intent on destroying it. Peter wrote about it. Paul has wrote about it numerous times. Jude, I love the little book of Jude, how, how he talks about it. But there's always people trying to get in to the church and destroy it. In, in uh, England, New England, over 150 years ago, in New England, 150 years ago, churches were evangelical in their, in their mission. And they had good foundation. But they began to let Unitarian pastors come in and minister in those churches. And at first, the pastors did not share their, their true belief openly and declare themselves openly, but they began to build on a structure and little by little they changed the doctrine the mission and the ministry of the church and within a matter of years you could look down and you couldn't even look down and realize that the structure was what it was meant to be by Christ they had built a side porch off here to let these people be a part of the church and, and over here to, to allow these people to, to, to be called Christians also. And pretty soon we have a church that calls himself Christian that is not built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. A study that was done and, and uh, I didn't put down my where I got it from exactly, but uh, I think it was, uh, what's, the, what's the big uh, uh, research firm? Barna. Not Barna, it's, it's the secular one. Uh, what? Gallup. Gallup, you got it, Gallup, it was Gallup polls. They had, uh, they had an article that was written off of a Gallup poll about Christians. The headline reads this, nearly 40% of U.S. Gen, X, Gen Z's, not X's, Gen Z's. 40% of Gen Z's. 30% of young Christians identify as LGBTQ, poll shows. So they're saying 40% of the United States is made up of Gen Z's right now. And 30% of those Gen Z's say they identify as Christian and LGBTQ, the poll shows. Not that they're practicing it, but they are accepting of it in its lifestyle and manner. And they're Christians. They claim to be Christians. See, we have destroyed what Christian means. Christians should mean we're built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. We're built on the principles laid out 
in his word. We're built on truth, not what feels too good today. I wish I could take you back and, and walk you through the first 11 chapters of Genesis, and, and, but I don't have time today, and some of you have already fallen asleep at least once. <laughs> but, but through Genesis, and, and then, into, then into the early, early part of uh, maybe chapters 15, 16, and 17 about Sodom and Gomorrah, and, and, and we're headed for the same direction they were at. We have destroyed truth. We have destroyed truth. The, yet the other night, took uh, Vicky and, and, and Faith out to dinner. We went to uh, uh, Zona Rosa. Went to one of our places that we like to go out at Zona Rosa. And, and of course, we went there on a Friday night. Who does that on a Friday night? I did. Okay. Went on a Friday night. Got there a little late. Got there at 7. And, and they told us it would be an hour and a half wait. And it's like, oh, hour and a half wait. And I thought, well, it's going to take us how long to get in the car and go find someplace else? We got lots of stuff around here. We can, we can take our time. Gave them our phone number, and they were going to buzz us. So we walked down to uh, Barnes & Noble. Love it. Loved going to Barnes & Noble. Going to Barnes & Noble, the bookstore, the giant bookstore, and I begin to look. I first begin to people look. That was a mistake. I then began to book look, and I, and I, and I walked past the magazines, and, and magazines aren't anything like they used to be because you can get it all on the internet now. Why, why go through the magazine rack? I ended up finding my wife and daughter there later, but, uh, they, you know, I walked by the magazine rack. I walked to the books. I walked to the, I walked to the uh, nonfiction books. As I scrolled through the nonfiction books, I found lots of books that I would have classified as fiction. Like, why is this there? Why are you allowing this author who, who definitely doesn't know truth to be nonfiction? I walked to the, I walked to the historic area and, and was going through some, some uh, 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 truth books, I believe. Some of them were truth. And I'm looking through those. And you know what? I was the only one there. And all these other people with all their different dues. And I mean dues here and here. I'm not judging them, but the stuff that they're putting in their heart and in their mind and what, what's controlling their lives is not this. It's not truth. It's, I went to the, the how-to book, book area. It's full of people. Yeah, the encouragement area where they're, where they're talking about, you know, self-help area. Oh, it's full of people looking how they can find somebody to help them. I got it. So I went up to where you can get all that you need. The religious section. I was the only one there. Now I'm not judging all those people because I find myself drawn to some of those books also. Some of those interesting authors, some of those uh, interesting stories, some, some great recent history and, and some, some great past history that people have really done a lot of research on. I enjoy that, but here's the fact. We got a bunch of people building their lives, building their temples on foundations that are going to crumble apart. Over the last two years, I've watched people crumble because of fear. Build, build their lives around one concept and then that concept or what they call truth changes within three months, six months, nine months, a year. It's disturbing. Boy, I need to find a place to land, don't I? Paul said, if a teacher does this, if a teacher destroys the work of God and destroys the temple, he will pay with his eternal life. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. Let me close and I'll try to do it rapidly. This, this passage that I've given you in 1 Corinthians 
how can we apply it to our lives? I'll come up with six quick points. Number one, let us be vigilant to keep Christ as the foundation of our church. Not only the foundation of our church, but the foundation of our lives. Don't, don't let us start building porches on the side of our lives or on the side of our churches that, that detract or take us away from what? Know him, love him, show him. Let, let us not detract from, from the salvation message and the truth of God's word and, and living our lives according to the truth of God's word and training our children in that same manner. Number two, let's make sure that the building blocks of our doctrine follow the beautiful contours of the foundation and not go off and try to make some little porch on one side of the foundation or the other or let's skimp on the roof so that, so that the foundation gets uh, uh, soaked and the, and, the, and the ground around it gives way. Number three, let's take the attitude of our church because we have a lot of attitudes here. And, and I'm proud of our, most of our attitudes. I really am. I, I don't know how you felt when you come into this building this morning, but most of the time you come in and the, and the people that you meet, they, they are loving. They, they want you to be here. There's a spirit of, of joy that we are here. But at times we need to make sure that we sit down with those that are out of line and we need to set them back in line on the foundation. Well, I'm upset because you don't have this or you don't do this or you don't do that there. Well, let me tell you, <clears throat> we line up with know him, love him, show him, and all the ministries that we're doing right now are lined up in that, minute, in that way. And they're fitting on the foundation that God has laid here. If someone comes in here with a bad attitude and doesn't want to be here, let me tell you, if they're not changed by the Spirit of God when they've been here a while, then they don't need to be here. You say, Tracy, that is mean and that is bad. And let me tell you, if you're not going to let the Spirit change you, then you've just come here to try to change us and we're not going to be changed. I, I, I have watched more churches be destroyed by, by people that have come into church with the wrong attitude and the wrong spirit. And they've pecked away at the foundation. They, they first started they start, first started with the windows, then the roof, and then the electrical, and then they just worked their way right into the foundation and ultimately destroyed the church. Number four, let's bring all ministries and all our building plans and all the financial goals and lay them like a transparency over the blueprint of our foundation, Jesus Christ and his word. And let's ask, do they fit? Do they match up? As we built this building, I love the plans. You could go in sequence, you could see the footing diagram. You could turn the page and the, over the footing diagram was the walls and over that you had electrical, you had, all, you had the plumbing, you had all the different layers that all fit perfectly within what? The kind, confines of the foundation. We need to do that regularly as a church. Number five, let Christ be the one and only foundation of the Hill Ministries. I don't want to be the foundation. I'm not the foundation. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just the shepherd that God called to be here. And I'm, I'm here until God calls me to, calls me home, calls someone else to be the shepherd, calls me away. I don't have the answers that God does. I could tell you a lot about that maybe next week. Number six, let his influence be utter, utterly throughout all we do. Know him, love him, show him. 
The world is sick and lost. And Christ followers have the cure and the Savior. Are we giving it out? I, I can tell you, they, they put on a full-blown full program to get the vax out. I mean, they, they want everybody to be vaccinated. They, want, they, they put it out. They, they promote it. And I'm, not, I'm not going vax, anti-vax. I'm just telling you, they put forth all the efforts they could to get everybody on board. And we have the cure to all these issues. We have the cure to all these problems. And what do we do? We stay right here, comfortable, nice and cozy, and we think, this is nice. You have the answers. You have the cure. When you go to a bookstore, you read. Here's a poem that I read many years ago. I came across it, I wrote it down, and I found it this week. It says this, My friend, I stand in judgment now and feel that you're to blame somehow. On earth I walked with you by day and never did you show the way. You knew the Savior in truth and glory, but never did you tell the story. My, my knowledge then was very dim. You could have led me safely to him. Though we lived together here on earth, you never told me of the second birth. And now I stand before eternal hell because of heaven's glory you did not tell. Anonymous. We need to be sharing the cure that we have. We need to be giving and applying the vaccination for all of life's sin as much as we can. We need to promote, believe in God and you'll believe in miracles, believe in his son and you'll experience one. Let's stand. What I've given you today, let it take a place in your heart and let it change you. In Isaiah 40, verse 8, it says this, The grass withereth, the flower fade, but the word of the Lord will stand forever.
what a great service we just had. You know, Pastor really talked about building your foundation and then what, is, what else is built from that moment up. What your windows look like, what your electrical looks like. And I pray that we examine our lives today and see how we stand. Don't let us get so far away from what God is doing, how God is constructing you, that you're letting the world construct you and build upon you. Um, now is the day that we need to focus on what is going on in our lives and inner focus on what we need to do to get closer to God. There's amazing opportunities. You can speak to somebody in our office. You can get prayer. You can give an offering. Jennifer, how do we do all this? So if you want to um, communicate with anyone in our office through comments, questions, or prayer requests, you can do so office at thehillministries.church and someone will get back to you. And if you want to be a part of today's offering, then you can do so several different ways. You can download the Secure Give app and search for The Hill Ministries. You can go online to thehillministries.church and click on the Giving tab or join us next week live in person and put it in the back of the sanctuary. This is your home church. Be part of something. We love you.